I had just finished interviewing John Delancey and all these people were moving towards the doors. My cameraman asked a passing brony why everyone was leaving and they said that there was a fire on the main stage. The crew told me we, we should probably leave too, but I said, no, pick up that camera, we're going to the fire. True stories. Brony Con, Secrets and Confessions. Okay, so for those of you who don't know me, I hosted a show called The Equestrian Inquirer as the character Joe Stevens. I envisioned myself as a sort of Jon Stewart or Daily Show of the brony fandom. I had a ton of fun being a part of the community and making what I thought was a pretty entertaining program. And even though I was not a real journalist, I mean, my whole shtick was being completely hyperbolic and, and absolutely a fake journalist. I apparently earned the attention of Final Draft at Everfree Radio and was invited to host the BronyCon livestream of 2012, and honestly, the experience changed my life. Everyone knows the story of bronies and how they came to be. I'm not here to talk about that or rehash old drama. I just figured that you might like some inside stories about all these cons. Obviously, you want to hear about the fire. While it wasn't a big deal, nobody knew that at the time. So, I was in a sort of tech room in the middle of the convention center. I had never interviewed anyone before, ever, and there I was holding a microphone in front of John Delancey. I was terrible and literally spent the whole time staring at my hand, demanding it to stop shaking. I don't care if it's you. You will stay still. Stay still. Don't, don't. We are real interviewer now. Stay still. Stay still. So we leave the interview and room and see the evacuation. Instead of evacuating, we decide that we're a real news crew now and we're going to head to the disaster. Like I said, there was a river of bronies between us and the fire and we were about 50 yards away. My cameraman at one point, he used the big tripod like a bat and swung his way through, which helped us swim against the stream. When we reached the fire, I remember my co-host, Tech Rat, he shouted, Joe, are you crazy? And I said, of course I'm crazy, now start filming. And we did. Other than nearly getting run over by a fire truck, it wasn't really all that dangerous. But we didn't know that at the time. I mean, the building could have burned down all around us and we would have just been there filming. I mean, it was stupid and awesome, but that was most things in the Brony fandom. I interviewed Andrea Libman there, but I don't think she liked me all that much. I just was not as prepared as I should have been, and, and asked her about the songs and, and uh, about her dubbing, and I don't think she liked that. Sorry, Andrea, that was my complete incompetence showing. I interviewed Amy Kidding Rogers there, too. She's one of the writers, and she is the best person I ever met who worked on the show. She and M.A. Larson, another writer who I interviewed at Midwestria in Chicago, I remember the first time I met Mitch, he was singing karaoke at the con, and it was a heavy metal song. At the end of this punky rebel song, he raised the mic and shouted, F Celestia! And everyone cheered. <laughs> then he went to anyone who'd filmed it and was worried. He, he said, I'm going to lose my job. You can't post that. You can't post it. You got to delete it. You got to delete it. I hope he doesn't mind me telling this story. Sorry, Mitch. Mitch was always the guy who would stay up late with the bronies. Two, three o'clock in the morning, you'd see him at the hotel bar, and Mitch would just be there holding court and just being the coolest guy ever. I guess I did a good enough job at that first con that they kept on asking me to do more live stream hosting. There was Everfree Northwest, where I got to meet a ton of the voice actors and production team members. I got to know people like Tara Strong, who voiced Twilight. She actually recognized me a few times. She's so nice, and she gushes over every character she's ever played, especially the Powerpuff Girls. She's a Hollywood actress, but that's not really a bad thing. She just loves that she got to be these characters and will bring them out at the drop of the hat. I remember chatting with her while she was eating a salad in the green room, and she would just start talking as bubbles to her lunch. It was awesome. I interviewed all three of the voice actresses who played the Cutie Mark Crusaders. I remember Madeline Peters, the voice of Scootaloo, was older than the other two, so she was a bit more quiet and a little bit freaked out by all the bronies. Claire Corlett, the voice of Sweetie Belle, was just a ball of energy and bouncing off the walls. Michelle Krieber, the voice of Apple Bloom, I saw her a lot more often. I had dinner with her family and a bunch of other people in Las Vegas. She was a huge fan of The Office, and I just started watching it at the time. So there I was at a buffet in Vegas talking about The Office with the voice of Apple Bloom. I mean, you know, laughing about Kevin spilling his chili. It was, it was pretty surreal. That con in Vegas was the most notorious con I went to, Las Pegasus Unicon. Everyone had high hopes for it, but honestly, we should have seen the warning signs. But the best part of the con, though, was when Dusty Cat, the manliest brony in the world, who I got to be very good friends with, he's awesome. He hosted the manliest room party in the world. 
He even made these commemorative keys and, and had a, a bartender in his suite. All the guests were there, but I spent most of the evening with Sam Vincent, who voiced a few people on MLP, but for me, he was Double D from Ed, Ed, and Eddie. I remember I was drinking scotch with Double D and just gushing over this guy when we hear that the con is out of money and in debt to the hotel. The con is falling apart and everyone needs to figure out how to pay for things. The VIPs won't get paid. The con share is nowhere to be found. Everything is falling apart. Everything just ended. I wound up paying in cash for my hotel room because I didn't want a record tracing me back to that nutso event. I mean, there was a fire alarm there too, but it was just a false alarm. Really should have evacuated then. I got to know John Delancey somewhat at that con. I interviewed him twice and had dinner with him. I always tried to strike up a conversation. Ask him what sports he liked. He told me he was planning on taking a boat trip across the Pacific Ocean. He was fine on camera, but just uninterested. At one point in BronyCon 2012, John got in front of the crowd and said, I am with you. And we felt like we really could do something, accomplish something, make the world a better place. I think Las Pegasus was the first time we saw that that was not going to happen. I actually went up to John at the end of that con and asked him if he was still with us. He said yes, but I don't think either of us believed the Bronies were actually going to make the world a better place. I still hoped, but future cons revealed that the movement was a bit more hype than substance. See, that was the thing about brony cons. They made you believe in the power of friendship. It's corny, but we thought we could make this men-loving, girly things into a, a rising of empathy, a, a normalizing of male caring. But I guess it was just like Occupy Wall Street or something. It, it felt good, but we, we didn't really have a place to put all that energy. We didn't have a policy or leadership or anything. We got some charity money, so it wasn't all useless, but there, there was a feeling like we could change the world, and it, and it never turned into anything. By 2013, brony cons were different. Everfree Radio got offered $9,000 to live stream the event. There was a lot of anger about that, but I was asked to host again. I remember the year before in New Jersey, we had 10,000 people watching. In Baltimore, in a bigger convention center with twice as many attendants, we had at most 3,000 streaming it. I knew it was the end for me. I never interviewed Ashley Ball, and I always wished I could. I interviewed Nicole Oliver, the voice of uh, Celestia, and I, I brought a banana to it. There was a crappy banana meme at the moment that was not very nice, but I thought she might have fun just saying the word banana on screen and just pointing to it and laughing. Haha. Ha. I wanted to clear it with her first, of course. Uh, but the, the, before I can say anything, she just looks at me and says, No. I guess Nicole knew about the meme and wanted nothing to do with it. Kathy Westluck, the voice of Spike, was super nice. I interviewed her a couple times. What was great was every single member of the crew was amazing and so happy to get some exposure, even from a fake YouTube journalist like me, and I got to interview a ton of them. I never went to another BronyCon after 2013. I didn't do any more live streaming, and there really wasn't an audience for it anyway. I haven't contributed to the fandom in ages, but I still remember it fondly. I think when you think you can change the world and the energy dies, you get really disillusioned. But I also think I ended my time on a high note. The audience was still there and so was the energy, even though it was heading down. But what was great was the many people who took what they learned being in the Brony fandom and made something great. Several of the people I worked with made the fan episode Double Rainboom. They wanted me to work on their new animation project, True Tale. I ended up writing a pilot episode for them and actually created the names and the, and, and the characters uh, and, and a lot of the setting, along with my good friend Bernadette Martin. So many people who worked on projects like True Tale now work in animation in Hollywood or Atlanta. So many took what they learned and made a career out of it. And those are the people, like me, who have no regrets. See, so you shouldn't regret what the fandom was. Out of that energy and that large audience, people like me discovered talents they didn't even know they had. We should have known being horse famous wasn't a career itself. But we took what we learned and we made something out of it. And that's beautiful. If you spent all that time watching the fandom fade and didn't take anything from it, I get it, that's sad. But many people like me learned a ton and it legitimately changed their lives. I'm now a full-time writer and academic because I decided I wanted to spend the rest of my life writing. So I have Lauren Faust, who I only met once, Amy Keating Rogers, and Emma Larson, who all helped jump start my career. I have all these wonderful people to thank for the life I have today. Bronies changed my life. And maybe they changed yours too. And I guess that means we really did change the world. Man, that's corny. I don't know. F Celestia! True stories! True stories! True stories! <laughs> okay.
Can't get it to land right.